I would like to introduce our speaker, Michael Dupi. Um, Michael is a certified biomimicry professional in training, a teaching fellow at the Boston College Center for Corporate Citizenship, and an entrepreneur. From 2002 to 2014, Michael was Vice President of Sustainable Innovation at Keurig Green Mountain, where he established a sustainable innovation function and set an agenda for embedding sustainability more thoroughly into the company's innovative activities. From 2004 to 2012, he had served as the Vice President for Corporate Social Responsibility at Keurig Green Mountain, where he established and developed an award-winning and internationally recognized corporate sustainability practice, delivering shared value and expanding the organization's commitment to sustainability in a dynamic high growth context. He led the effective deployment of over, are you ready for this, $49 million globally on issues ranging from food security to climate change to fair trade. Prior to joining Keurig Green Mountain in 2004, Michael was vice president at Goldman Sachs, managing and making and managing opportunistic investments um, in distressed financial assets. Michael is in a 2011 Aspen Institute First Mover Fellow, a 2004 Donna Meadows Sustainability Leadership Fellow, and a board member for Grounds for Health. He is a candidate for a master's in science degree in biomimicry from Arizona State and holds both a Juris Doctor cum laude and a master's in business administration degrees from Georgetown and a bachelor of arts in history from Boston College. And he is an all around really awesome guy. <laughs> so um, we've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Mike um, for several years. And so without further ado, I'd like to turn over to Mike. But let's give him an, a, a preemptive applause. So, all right, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, and thank you all for being here. I know you got lots of other um, things to do. Um, but, but Lindsay, big thanks to you. We've been scheming about how to bring biomimicry into the Champlain community for a while, um, as well with Lori, Lori Quinn, the provost. So um, I'm very grateful for that. Um, here's what I want to do today. At the end of this hour, I'm, I'm hopeful that you will know uh, how scorpions um, help make better, better brain surgeons. Did anybody Google that out of curiosity? Does anyone already know the answer? I would be bummed if you had, actually, so I'm psyched. Uh, so I'm going to save it till the end. Um, like any good teaser, you won't find out till the end. But, um, but oh, hopefully at the end of this as well, you're going to know a lot more about what biomimicry is, why, uh, how we do it, why we do it, um, what's the big deal, how does it work. Um, and, then, and then thirdly, I'm, I'm hopeful that I will plant some seeds today um, with some of you that, that maybe a week from now, maybe 10 years from now, whenever it is, you'll find an opportunity uh, to look to nature for some answers, for some solutions to challenges that you can't solve uh, in any other way, and you can uh, and you can meet some success that way. So, so let's get into it. Where does it all start? It starts with innovation. Innovation is a, is a it's a buzzword. It's a real thing, but it's certainly a buzzword today. We are all looking for innovation. It doesn't matter if you're whether you're in industry or civil society or government. It doesn't matter if you're running a company or trying to raise a family. We're all looking for new ways, better ways to do the things we need to do, to meet our needs and to get things done. But typically, when we think about innovation, we tend to glorify the human brain. We think it's, it's, it's a brain process. We, we idolize industrial designers today and software engineers for their ability to think their way through problems. And we spend, as a, as a society, we spend millions of dollars on books and videos and seminars that are going to tell us what to read and how to how to network and how to schedule our day and how to manage our energy and what to eat and when to all in the name of becoming more creative, more innovative, and coming up with better solutions. Um, and it all boils down to human cleverness. We're, we're really just focused almost exclusively on human cleverness. But what if human cleverness wasn't enough? And what if it didn't need to be enough? And I would, I would argue that it doesn't need to be enough because, in fact, innovation is the oldest biological process on this planet. Uh, the Earth's been around for four and a half billion years. Life has been on this planet for 3.8 billion of those years, figuring out how to survive and thrive. And there's a ton of wisdom embedded in there if we, if we just know how to look, right? So 4.5 billion years of, of the existence of planet Earth, 3.8 billion years of life on this planet. Those are big numbers. Um, and, and in today, you know, we hear about defense spending and budget deficits and population explosion and global health care costs. And so these numbers were sort of desensitized 
to these numbers. What does that really even mean? So we're, I've got a, a, an experiment here. We'll take a short walk through, um, through the history of life on Earth, but we're going to take those four and a half billion years and we're going to mush it down to one year. Okay? So here's, here's this one year, and, and we're going to be here. We'll start over here when the Earth is formed, and, and we'll assume that this is about one second after midnight on January 1st, and we're going to be sitting over at the other end about one second before midnight on December 31st at the end of recorded history. And we'll walk through the milestones of life on Earth to give us a little bit of perspective at how innovation has occurred on this planet and how we as humans, with our cleverness, fit in. Okay? So the first milestone here is February 20th. Anybody's birthday? February 25th? That's, that's life's birthday in this context. That's when life uh, originated on this planet. For the first month and a half or so, it's the primordial soup. Uh, a lot of stuff cooking, nothing really moving. But on February 25th, life occurs. March 28th, about a month later, we see photosynthesis for the first time. And single-celled organisms begin to populate the planet. Between, uh, between March 28th and August 16th, it's just single cells. On August 16th, we begin to see the multi-celled organisms. You know, another innovation milestone, some new development, a new way to solve problems. But then the real cool stuff happens on September 17th. Anybody know what that is? Sexual reproduction. So for the first time, we, we see species reproducing by exchanging genetic information between two different individuals. Uh, wow, that is a cool way to do this. And just from a mathematical perspective, you can, you can, you can follow that the, the combinatorial possibilities are just massively larger now, right? The innovation possibilities are endless. So let's focus in on this, uh, this last quarter of the year, because as, as you might imagine, now that sexual reproduction is on the table, things are going to heat up. So September 17th, sexual reproduction is on the table. For the next, I don't know, two months, uh, everybody's trying to figure out what to do. But November 15th, it starts to happen. We see fungi. And then things start to show up in rapid succession. Fish, November 20th. Land plants, November 22nd. Thanksgiving, we celebrate it with the arrival of insects, beetles. December 2nd. We get amphibians. They came first. Then came the reptiles a little bit later, December 6th. December 13th, we get the mammals. We get birds on December 18th, and then flowers finally on December 20th. There we go, December 20th. So all of this life, uh, and all, I mean, there was life here when we had single cell and then the multi celled organisms. But with the advent of sexual reproduction, oh my gosh, look at what's happening here. All kinds of crazy stuff is happening as, as, as life begins to assert itself and figure out how to fit in on this planet. Next big development was on December 25th, Christmas Day. Any guesses as to what that was? It's the asteroid. Merry Christmas, dinosaurs. You're out of here. Okay, and that, that feels like so long ago, right? But in, in this context of one year, uh, of four and a half billion condensed to one, we're on the 31st. This is only six days ago. It was so long ago, but in the overall context, it's only six days ago. Um, we still haven't seen modern or even the precursors to modern man on this planet. That's what shows up, shows up next. Hominids, uh, the first two-legged primates to walk on the planet. Anybody have any guesses as to when they show up? December 30th. December 30th? Good guess. It's the 31st at about 11.30 in the morning. So again, context of this entire year, we showed up, uh, our ancestors showed up on this planet about 12 and a half hours ago. And then modern man, Homo sapiens, 11.36 p.m. 12 hours later, 24 minutes left in this year, and we've got modern man showing up. Okay? Next big development, the agricultural revolution. 10,000 years ago, in this context, it's just a minute of time. Just a whisper of time has passed since we first began to figure out how to evolve from the nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle into agricultural techniques where we could stay in one place, cultivate community. And then the big one, the industrial. And let's just throw the technology, technological revolution as well in here. The last two, three hundred years where we've seen some unbelievable achievements that have brought us planes and trains and cars and rocket ships and refrigerators and washing machines and plastic. 
uh, iPads, iPods, right? Um, and to us, this is, the, this is the pinnacle of innovation, right? In human history, absolutely the pinnacle. Um, but in this context, do you, does it really make sense to claim that, that we have cornered the market on innovation with our human cleverness when we've really only been on this planet for a few hours and we've only been innovating for the last couple seconds relative to life on Earth, right? Can we, can we really claim the high road there? Can a skyscraper ultimately really compare favorably to the living genius that is a forest with everything that goes on there? Or how about an oil reef with a coral reef? Um, I, now, this is not, my intention with regard to man-made invention is not to deride it for the most part. Um, human cleverness is transformational, but it's not the only source of wisdom. It's not the only source of inspiration. And it may not even be the most useful in many contexts, right? 30 million species on this planet right now. We've only named a little under 2 million of them. Um, and this is the cream of the crop, right? This is the, the these, these are the species that have stood the test of time. This is the 1%. 99% of everything that's ever lived on this planet is gone because they couldn't make it work. And the 1% that's left, that includes us. We are the cream of the crop. And there's a ton of wisdom there if we can just find a way to access it. If we can learn how to ask the right questions, hear the answers, and if we know what to do with it once we hear those answers. And that is the essence, really, of biomimicry. So how do we do it? Well, first, you've got to be ready to ask nature. We've got to remember that we're a very young species on this planet. The, the, the walk through time showed us that. We can, we can take on the perspective of a child. Um, I remember, you guys are young enough, you should still remember when it was okay to ask questions, right? When you, you would ask questions without any sense of shame or fear. It's just a question, I'm just trying to learn. That's the approach that, that we can adopt in going to nature. Um, ask the silly questions. Learn to listen to the answers. This is, what, this is another way of thinking about what biomimicry is about. It's the conscious emulation of nature's genius. And those words are, are, are very specific. They're not randomly chosen. Um, conscious implies intent. It's not a mistake that we're going to nature. One, one innovation that's often cited as an example of biomimicry is Velcro. I don't know how many folks know the story there. There's a guy, he, he, I think he was hunting, and he'd come out of the, the brush, and the burrs would be stuck to his pants, and he looked at it under the microscope and found the hook and loop and evolved it. Um, great invention, but maybe not biomimicry, because it wasn't conscious. He wasn't going into nature on purpose to ask questions. He, he happened to stumble into it, so you know, good on you. Um, but biomimicry is intended to be conscious. We want to go to nature on purpose. Emulation is the second point. This is not slavishly imitating nature. Um, I don't know how, how many of you have noticed uh, airplane wings, right? They used to be like this. At some point, they started to be in shape like this. Well, that's birds. If you see seabirds, when they're cruising along over the water, they've got the tips of their wings flapped up, and it helps, it helps with lift. At some point, somebody said, hey, that might be a good idea for us to put that on airplanes. They didn't put feathers on airplanes, right? They, they abstracted out the design principle from what the birds were doing and applied that to airplanes. That's emulation. And then nature's genius. So it's kind of self-explanatory, right? I'm gonna drum this in over and over. 4.5 billion years, plants been in existence. 3.8 billion years of innovation. There is a ton to learn there. The example here, I think, is a really great one. Anyone know this example, the bullet trains? In Japan, when they built them, the trains would be flying, or flying along, going through the tunnels at 300 kilometers an hour, and as they came out of the tunnels on the other end, there'd be this loud boom. And what was happening was as they went into the tunnel, they were, they were creating this pocket of air that they were pushing through the tunnel, and as they came out the other side, it would kind of boom out, and pop like a bubble, um, almost a sonic boom kind of thing. Um, it was driving everybody nuts. It was disturbing the wildlife. The neighbors hated it. One of the engineers on this project um, was a bird. And he had watched kingfishers. I don't know if you know kingfishers. They dive down into the water to get their prey. And he had seen a kingfisher dive in, making almost no noise in the air and almost no splash when he went in. So he thought, maybe there's something about the kingfisher that we might be able to emulate that could help us solve this problem. So they took the shape of the kingfisher's beak right here and applied it to this train and tested it out. And guess what? No boom. And not only that, the aerodynamic uh, improvements helped them uh, save 10 to 15% on fuel as well. All right, so great example of biomimicry here. So when we do emulation, there's three levels. There's, there's form, process, and system. These are progressively more complex 
but they're all useful. Form, I think you can follow that. That's structure, right? And these are, this is three versions there with, with the Nautilus. So the Nautilus shell structure is right here. We see the Fibonacci sequence. Um, the Nautilus shell has been imitated in, um, in propellers and fans and things that try to manipulate uh, material flows, water, air, et cetera. Um, that's mimicking the form. Process is not only what nature is doing, but how is it doing it? And then lastly, the system is the interaction. How does the whole system fit together? Where do the raw materials come from? Where do they go at the end of life? Who else is participating in this system? How do we interact with them? These are all the levels that we look to in biomimicry for evolution. So when we do that, when we pull these design principles out, like the design principle from the, uh, from the kingfisher, um, those exist in and of themselves on their own. But underneath those principles, there's another set of principles that really underlie all of nature's innovations. And if you think of the, um, the earth and the elements, wind, water, uh, weather, uh, as let's say that's the hardware of our system, these principles, which in biomimicry we call life's principles, um, that's the operating system. These are the, this is the behavioral code that allows life to flourish on this planet. There's 26 in all, uh, grouped into six main master principles. And let me walk through each of these six and give you an example. This first one you can see is evolve to survive. Evolve to survive, this means that life likes to replicate what works. And it doesn't care how it does it. We'll do it through heredity or we're going to copy. And the key to that is information. You've got to get as much information as you can from as many sources as you can. And you want to mix it up into as many combinations as you can and see what works. Right? Sounds a lot like technology innovation today. The example I've got here uh, is tuskless elephants. Um, I think we all know the story about elephants. In 1989 or so, there was a million today. That population's been cut down to half. And they, uh, people estimate 8% of the population is lost every year to poachers. Um, tuskless elephants used to occur in the population normally, say, 2 to 5%. Um, and in recent years, they've seen it up as high as 10 or 15%. And there's even one... Uh, national Park in Africa that's reporting it up near 40% uh, being born without tusks. So what's happening there? Well, it's one of two things. Either the females are selecting males without tusks as a strategy, or the only males left to reproduce are the ones who don't have tusks. And in any event, the tuskless trait is what's being passed on, and you see natural selection operating in an interesting way to remove what is possibly the, the single greatest threat to the existence of elephants. Right? Now, the tusks aren't useless. Elephants use them in battle to defend themselves. They use them to dig in the ground for roots and, and the like. But, but obviously, there's a choice being made here that the, the danger represented by the poachers and by the, the danger represented by the, the possession of tusks is greater than the danger you would face by not having tusks to defend yourself or find food. Okay. Next is adapting to changing conditions. This is about responding to the different stimuli in the world uh, in a positive and productive way. There's a lot going on. Um, and we see it in our lives just as human beings in the human environment, but out in nature as well. There's, there's predatory predators, and then uh, weather changes, and then there's predators, and then predators, and more predators. Lots of things going on. The octopus is, is in the picture here. Octopus and cuttlefish have great reputations for being shapeshifters. I don't know how many of you have ever seen some of the videos on these guys. This is the mimic octopus uh, here, and this is a mimic octopus as well. These guys can change the color of their skin, they can change the texture of their skin, and then they have the intelligence to manipulate their physical bodies to resemble other creatures. So when a predator shows up, they will impersonate other organisms in a way that hopefully sends the predator packing. So up here, it's taking on the shape of a, a sole leaf fish, or a leaf sole fish, I think it's called. Down here, it has, uh, it's impersonating a sea snake. It's got its two arms out waving like two different sea snakes, and he's buried the rest of his body in the sand to hide the rest of it. That is one smart octopus, okay? Adapting to changing conditions. Third is, is locally attuned and responsive. This is about fitting in, fitting in with your local environment, understanding what's going on cyclically, listening to feedback, trying to cultivate good relationships where you can. This is a fennec fox who lives in the Sahara Desert. And as you might imagine, it gets ungodly hot in the Sahara Desert. So what has this fox done to attune itself to the local environment? Number one, it's gone nocturnal. It's a lot cooler at night. And it's adjusted its diet over time so that it will prey on the animals that are active at night. 
But as well, those ears, those funky ears, are a key adaptation as well in two ways. One is you've got exposed skin, which helps them thermoregulate. It's a way to cool themselves down. And secondly, those ears are so sensitive that they can hunt at night more effectively just by sound. So you're not going to be able to see very well at night. All right. This is integrating development with growth. This is, this is the idea that it's not just bigger that we're aiming at, and it's not just better, it's bigger and better. We want to optimize. Sometimes we're going to pick one over the other, uh, and often if you have to choose in nature, you're going to choose development, not growth, which is not the choice most often made, I would argue, in, in business. Uh, maybe it should be. This, this is a uh, Couch's Spadefoot Toad. <clears throat> um, interesting in this context, they, um, they lay their eggs in vernal ponds. These are the, the, in the spring, the, the little ponds that show up and maybe by June they've evaporated and gone away. Um, they lay their eggs, those eggs will hatch very quickly within a week. They will mature from tadpole to, to froglet or baby tiny frog um, in two weeks or less. And then they're monitoring the moisture in the pond as they develop and grow, as they become more mature inside their brain matures, their organs mature, but also as they grow to full size. If they detect that the moisture levels are going down, if it's a hot summer, and they're gonna, the, the, let's say the, the vernal pond usually lasts until June 1st, and somehow they, they, they're sensing moisture and they realize it might be May 20th, they will, they will reallocate uh, the processes in their body to accelerate development at the cost of growth. They make, a, they make an evolutionary, a biological choice that I would rather have mature, uh, mature toads that are able to defend themselves and reproduce than take a chance and wait just, for the, just, just on the outside chance that we're going to be able to reach the proper size. So that's an example of optimizing and balancing development with growth. Be resource efficient. Waste not, want not. Check if your lab is on. If my what is on? Uh, is the, micro the microphone, the wireless one, is on or not? It has been on, yeah. I think so. Nope. Is that better? Uh, yeah. Oh, it wasn't on. I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. Okay. That didn't cause this, though, did it? No, no. no I just. I just didn't want to interrupt you. Okay. Is um. Okay. Okay. Well, let's 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 pause. We're, let's we have to pause. Um, but while we're waiting, this is adaptation. yeah. While well, while we're waiting, let's see if there's any Q and A, any observations, comments, or questions that, that anybody has right now. How would they know they're being hunted? Yeah, well, you know what, I, I, I guess I'll give two answers. Um, one is maybe they don't, right? In which case, it would probably be the, the latter explanation, that there's the males that are left are the ones without tusks. Um, but I also, and, and it, it, with elephants in particular, um, I'm not going to presume that we know what they know and what they don't know. Elephants have been known to do some really unbelievable things that, um, that betray a certain kind of intelligence that, that really freaks people out uh, in terms of knowing, knowing where to go um, years after they've been somewhere, recognizing relatives um, years after one of them has been taken away and sent to the circus and things like that. So it, it, I, I don't have any proof uh, or any research, but it's not to me beyond the realm of possibility that there may be an elephant that has figured out that I'd rather be with the elephants that don't get chased by those bad guys. Maybe they don't necessarily say, that's a tusk, that's not a tusk. But somehow they're able to figure that out. That's, that's the, the cool thing about natural selection, though. And, you know, at one level, as humans, we want it to be intentional. We think we have to make choices. Um, natural selection is, uh, is, is, is a way that this all operates um, without really having to worry about whether we make the right choice. Um, and it speaks to the power of these life's principles. You can, you can, you can you can adapt your activities to fit, or you can pay the price at some point, right? So the 99% that's gone, 
uh, that's what's happened with them. How are we doing on the reset? Not so good. <laughs> okay. Another question, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the question, if you didn't hear it, was to um, talk a little about the history of biomimicry as a field of study, and how long has it been going on, and how long could you have studied it? So the the practice of biomimicry has been going on for as long, um, you know, for as long as life has been around. Um, um, other organisms would would learn from the way other organisms in their ecosystem would do things. They'd copy it, and humans have been doing it. Um, you know, one example: the Native Americans in this country. Um, out west, the ones that would live in mud huts, how did they figure out how thick to build the walls? So they, they, um, I, I, I've been told they dug up animals that lived in the ground and figured out how thick their walls were and figured, well, this ought to keep us cool in the summer and warm in the winter, let's try that. Um, but it's, so it's been around for millennia. The, um, I think maybe the watershed point in bio, for biomimicry was in the mid-90s when Janine Benyus wrote the book, Biomimicry. So she literally wrote the book. Um, Again, it, the practice had been around, but um, it ha just hadn't really been formalized or distilled into um, a coherent kind of um, curriculum or, or theory. Um, Dana Baumeister uh, is, is Janine Benius' business partner in biomimicry. She was a, a PhD student at the time, and they got together and decided they were gonna uh, push this out on the world. And so since then, um, they have been active. Janine is kind of the uh, the noun, as this is the way they describe it. Janine is the noun and Dana is the verb. So Janine does a lot of writing and a lot of public speaking. Um, she's done a couple of TED Talks. She's kind of, I don't think she's been given a MacArthur Genius Award, but she's kind of that level of thinker in the world on this topic. And Dana's very, very active teaching and consulting with companies. So in, the, in uh, 2005 or so, um, uh, Lindsay had mentioned this fellowship. I was part of the Dana Meadows Sustainability Leadership Fellows Program. Dana was in that as a colleague with me, and she was looking to build a fellowship program around biomimicry to try and get it out there in the world. They had recognized that, um, that they alone couldn't make the kind of difference and they, that they wanted to, and so they wanted to get more people involved in it. So she began to create uh, more formal educational programs that were uh, professional certifications. So those were a, a biomimicry specialist and a biomimicry professional. And the specialist was a three-month program, or sorry, a three-workshop a three workshop program, so that would be about nine months. And the, um, uh, the professional was a two-year program with six workshops. Um, that's what I enrolled in uh, a few years ago. Um, in the meantime, she had been pursuing accreditation uh, formally with Arizona State University, which was just granted. So we, we will be, the class I'm in, will be the first class graduating with an official Master's of Science degree as well as the professional cert. Um, and, then the, and then there's also a, a biomimicry center at ASU for undergrads. Um, and then there is as well a doctoral program, level program at, at of all, I don't, nothing against Ohio, but it's at the University of Akron. Um, I, I don't really know why, but they have a PhD biomimicry program. Um, so those are all the, the formal ways. Um, the, the organization that, that Dana runs that puts all this stuff out in the world is called Biomimicry 3.8, 3.8 referring to the 3.8 billion years of life on this planet. And they offer a number of shorter intensives um, that may not necessarily get you a certification, but you might spend a week in a place like Costa Rica or the Sonoran Desert and, and dig into these principles. Maybe it's in a particular, particular context like um, social leadership or something like that, but they offer a number of, of other ways short of um, a nine-month program to engage as well. Is that helpful? Okay. All right. We're almost there. So while that fires up, I have a question. Yeah. Um, in your experience, has there been like one particular industry which has adopted Biomimicry is uh, uh, sort of a, uh, yeah. originator of ideas. Yeah. Is there one industry that's that's more plugged in, if plugged you will? Into yeah. Um, I would say. 
I would say it's probably uh, the, the um, I'll, I'll just call it the construction world is, is paying a lot of attention to it. I don't know that I'd say there's a huge amount of activity yet, but they're paying a lot of attention to it. And then medical is paying a lot of, and has for years, right? I mean, biomimicry is another way of talking about the guys that go out in the jungle and bring back the botanicals and try and understand what the properties are that treat certain conditions and let's mimic it um, artificially. Um, so, so uh, there we go, medical and, and pharma. Um, in the built environment, there's a couple of really famous examples. There's an architect, um, I believe an architect, Michael Pollan, who designed a shopping mall in Zimbabwe. And he really overtly and with high publicity used a termite mound as an inspiration for the airflow. So termite mounds stay really cool in the, in the heat and then they stay warm. Um, and and there's, there's a lot of intelligence there about how air conducts through the, the tunnels in the termite mound. And he used that to inform the development of a, of a shopping mall. Um, lots of conversations about things like lead standards and green building standards in the community. But I, I don't know that it's quite taken hold in actual execution yet. Right. And that doesn't surprise me because that was leading into my second question, which is, you know, with climate change happening, yeah. there's, don't you think there's going to be more need for this type of thinking and designing stuff to, yeah, no. to change climate change? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so he was, he, he was saying, given climate change as an example, won't there be more need for this kind of innovation and inspiration? And, and I think absolutely, and that's, that's one of my, my closing points, right, is that this offers a, a very concrete way to work on really big challenges that are important to all of life on this planet. Um, and plus it works, right? This isn't, this isn't some sort of crazy tree hugger thing, right? This is, this is, there's actual hard intelligence embedded in all these organisms. Um, great, so here we are now. We're back at our life's principles with our friend the sloth. So resource efficient, um, this is I think the fifth of the, the six master principles. Boils down to waste not, want not. Um, not, uh, not a terribly difficult concept. Um, but I think I love the sloth example in, in particular, right? Because sloth is one of the seven deadly sins. So one, one person's sloth is another person's masterful uh, resource efficiency expert. And the sloth is a masterful resource efficiency expert. They're, the food that they eat, their sole food source are the, the leaves on the trees where they live. Hard to digest, not a lot of energy, and everything about the sloth is oriented towards making the most of that resource. So they've got um, a unique bacteria in their digestive system that helps them digest the leaves and get the energy out. They have um, a lower level of musculature than other mammals. They uh, run at a lower body temperature. Um, just a variety, they move slower, variety of things that they do, uh, all at a much more reduced rate uh, to help them fit into their environment and be efficient with the resource that they do have. And then life-friendly chemistry. Um, for my money, this is the hardest one to get into and ultimately will prove to be the most important one. Um, the materials question in, in our consumer society is massive. Um, and, and it's all about life-friendly chemistry. So I, I don't know if any science people in the room. Um, I was not a science person growing up. Um, and, and if you had asked me about chemistry when I was a kid, it, it, I don't know if I would have articulated it, but to me that meant poison, right? That meant the stuff that's under the kitchen that you don't drink. It didn't mean water and, and, and the basic elements, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus. But that's what it means in nature, right? Nature works with a very limited subset of the periodic table, and it arranges them in ways that are easy to break down, and it does its chemistry in water. You contrast that with our industrial model, um, often affectionately referred to as heat, beat, and treat, where we take a ton of resources and manipulate these elements into combinations that nature would never have gone near in a million years, even if it could, um, and, and, and we create something, right? We create something that's, that's arguably useful, but often toxic and hard to get rid of. That ain't what nature does. This is a, uh, a glass sponge. Its formal name is, let me look it up, it's like the Venus basket. Um, yeah, the Venus flower basket. It's called the glass sponge because this is all essentially glass. This is an organism that lives in deep water in the ocean, and it extracts silicic acid out of the water, turns it into silica, and forms optic fibers. Um, it, it, again, does it in ambient temperatures in the water under pressure, um, but with no other chemicals other than what's in the water. You contrast that with how we make optic fibers um, artificially human beings. It's a process that requires uh, 2,000 degree Fahrenheit temperatures or higher. 
uh, a bunch of nasty chemicals, a very expensive, clean laboratory. Um, and then, and then the, the strength of this glass fiber, it is 100 times stronger than a comparable size uh, aluminum tube, right? So it's not a flimsy material. This is, this is chemistry that supports life, not chemistry in spite of life, all right? So now we've talked about biomimicry in theory. We've talked about abstracting design principles in the the six master principles. Let me, let me begin to close with three ex concrete examples. These are real business ventures. Some of them are in the market, some of them are not. Um, but to show you how this, how this works. So this first one is Sharklet Technologies. Um, this was uh, a, a project originated by the US Navy. So the, the boats in the Navy, they go out to sea. And when they come back in, the, the hull, the bottom that's underwater, is covered with sea creatures. It's all fouled up. Um, think about whales with the barnacles all over their body, right? That's what happens on the bottom of these boats. And the Navy, um, the Navy wants to make that happen less, right? They don't want the bottom of their boats fouled because it, it reduces aerodynamics and they spend more on fuel, uh, much more. Um, and the only way they've been able to figure out to get rid of it is by painting the hull with this horrifically toxic paint that pollutes the reef and, and actually doesn't do a very good job anyway. So they hired this guy and said, can you figure out something else? Can we do something else? So he was, um, I don't know if this is, they tell this story this way to make it sound romantic, but they say he was in uh, Pearl Harbor, standing there looking out at, at the ocean, and he saw a ship come in and, and it occurred to him what other um, creatures are out there in the ocean, slow moving, relatively speaking, that don't get fouled, right? Now I mentioned the whale, the whale's not it because it does get fouled, but what, what uh, slow moving marine creature doesn't get fouled and he eventually lands on sharks. So the sharks are swimming around all the time. When they need to, they can go pretty fast, but for the most part, they're cruising around, but they don't get fouled. Uh, and so he took a look at their skin under a microscope, and he identified uh, not only a ridging pattern, but a topography as well. And his hypothesis was that the combination of those two would prevent microorganisms, the very beginning of the food chain, from colonizing, and that prevents the next one and the next one and the next one. Tested it, and it turned out to be right. And he commercialized it as Sharklet Technologies coatings so these are coatings and paints you can put on your boat to prevent the fouling. Then he, then he had another inspiration. He extended it into coatings that they use now in hospitals, right? Often you hear of people go into a hospital and come out sicker than when they went in. Um, you can put this coating on the, the shelves and the surfaces in, in a hospital and, and see a similar reduction in the colonization from a bacterial perspective, okay? So real example. Um, Arnold Glass and Ornilux. Um, this is a bird crashing into a window. And in Europe, um, 100 million birds a year die from this. Massive number, right? Uh, we never see them because there's some person who walks around every morning and cleans up all the dead birds. But um, it was a big opportunity. And these guys started to look at it. These guys are a glass company. Um, started to look at it and try and figure out what might, what might we do about it. Um, somebody realized or observed that spiders build webs all over the place and you never see a bird fly into a spider web or flying around trailing spider webs. Um, they looked into that a little more and discovered that when a spider spins its web, um, it, it layers in a UV reflectant uh, layer in there, a thread. Uh, the silk is UV reflectant. So, and the birds can see the reflection of the ultraviolet light. So when a bird's flying, it sees the, the web and knows to avoid it. So their solution was to embed UV reflective glass uh, or create, put UV reflective glass in particular patterns in the glass. We as humans don't see it. Now in reality, if you saw one of these windows from the right angle, you, you would see it. But for the most part, we don't see it, but the birds do. And, and a, a massive drop in the number of birds running into the windows. Okay, and then our uh, featured, uh, our featured product. How do scorpions make for better brain surgeons? So, um, this one was uh, a, a, a real um, shocker for me. Brain surgery, uh, cancer tumors. Uh, I learned that when surgeons operate, I don't know if anyone knows anything about this, correct me on this if I'm wrong, but they operate on the brain, they operate from brain scans to know where the tumor is. And then they open the brain, <laughs> open the skull, and go in and operate on the brain. Apparently when they do that, it's really hard to tell where the tumor stops and the brain begins. And so they do the best they can, but sometimes you don't get all the tumor, and sometimes you get more than the tumor, and nobody wants that, right? So how might we improve our ability to just get the bad stuff and leave the good stuff in? Somebody discovered that a, uh, a component of scorpion venom, a chlorotoxin, 
uh, attaches itself to the chloride channels in cancer tumors, that it likes to stick around on those things, but it doesn't like to stick to, to brain tissue. So the, the inspiration then led to, well, what if we were able to match that, uh, a synthetic version of that with a marker, a paint, if you will, something that would light up when we needed it to? Um, could that help us paint the brain, identify the bad tissue, take it out, um, and be that much more effective? And in fact, that's what they did with tumor paint, um, which I believe was approved by the FDA last year. Okay. So these are, these are all these examples here of emulating nature. And, and, uh, and I'm going I'm to move it into the close here. It's really, there's three legs to the stool of biomimicry. Emulation is one of them. We've talked a lot about it here. Um, but emulate is necessary, but, but it's not enough. There's two other pieces super important to approaching biomimicry um, in the proper way. The second uh, we call reconnect. And, and we, we call it reconnect because for many of us, it evokes this time when we were younger and you were a kid and you got to go jump in the lake and go hiking and play in the fields and things like that when you had this connection to nature. Um, it's really about uh, finding the time to be in, back in nature. We're all busy. Um, many of us, we're lucky here. Many other folks live in really harshly urban environments and it's hard to get back into nature. Um, but that's what reconnect is about. Reconnect is saying that it's, it's important to be in nature and to remember that we are part of nature. We are not separate. The separation is artificial and, and we just have to be conscious of it. And we need to get ourselves to, to be an effective biomimic. We need to get ourselves to a place and a time where we can quiet our cleverness and we can, we can remember to have a little bit of humility in the face of 3.8 billion years of evolution um, and really truly engage with nature and learn from it. And then lastly, ethos. This speaks to why we do what we do. Um, it's great to design new products and services that solve needs. Um, it's great to make money, make a living. All of that is wonderful, but how much more wonderful is it if you're working on problems that matter? And for biomimics, that means trying to address, this is to your point earlier, trying to address the big, thorny social and environmental sustainability problems that, that face us on this planet. Climate change, um, clean water, ecosystem decline, hunger, poverty, health. Um, those are the things that, that, at the end of the day, we want our work to be about. And so the effective biomimic marries all three of these into, into one package. So that's biomimicry. What is biomimicry? We've talked about, it's, it's I give you three definitions. It's leveraging 3.8 billion years of, of, of evolution of nature's genius to solve human design problems. It's the conscious emulation of nature's genius. And it's emulating, reconnecting, and it's a sustainability ethos. Why does biomimicry matter? Four reasons. One is it works. Right, it works. There's, there's um, uh, my refrain, 3.8 billion years of evolution, 30 million species, there's something to learn there. It's, it's just undeniable. Secondly, there's massive opportunity. There's not a lot of people doing biomimicry today, so number, that's, that's opportunity number one. Secondly, uh, uh, there was a research um, study done a couple of years ago that mapped the human patent database with nature's solutions, right? So any challenge you might have, how does nature solve it versus how have we patented solutions to solve it as human beings? And there was only an 11 or 12% overlap. So that means for any problem that you have, if you go to nature, there is a nine in 10 chance that you're either gonna figure out how to do something that no one else has figured out how to do yet, or you're gonna learn how to do something that nobody else has even thought of yet, right? So this territory is, is rich. Uh, rich for the mining. Um, a third reason, and, and for those of you who are looking to, to go into business with an eye on sustainability, I spent 10 years in that field. Um, the terminology is, is really confusing, right? Is it citizenship or sustainability or, or whatever? And you go to three different companies and you get a bunch of different answers. Um, I, I had an experience in my career where we had a product and we wanted to make it more environmentally friendly, whatever that meant. Um, and we asked the people in the room, we got like 15 different answers on what that means. When you talk about sustainability, do you, do you, do you want it to be made of renewable materials or recyclable uh, or recycled or no carbon? Um, how much do you care about the supply chain? Does it need to be biodegradable or compostable? What's the difference, right? There's just so much confusion. For me, biomimicry provides a much more objective path to saying this is what it means to fit in on this planet. It's not negotiable, frankly. It's not ideological. It just is, right? You can't choose to ignore the facts. And so if I were building a career, as I continue to do in corporate sustainability, I think this is a really great true north map. 
And then lastly, biomimicry offers us, uh, offers us a path to engage in the problems that really matter. It gives us a way to um, find inspiration and drive a much deeper sense of purpose in the work that we do every day. And that may be the biggest deal of all. So that's what I've got prepared. We did a little Q&A already. Um, I'd love any other conversation or questions you might have. And I'm happy if we all talk among ourselves about it too. I don't have to be given any answers. But thank you for your time. Thanks for coming in on one of the uh, probably last few sunny afternoons. Um, and I, I hope it was worth it. collective problem solving and wow look at this from the abalone look at this from the sundew and, and if we can apply it and, and somebody then runs off and patents it when she or he didn't come up with the idea just because they're money grubbing little capitalists. Yeah. Um, I, so as you might imagine those are not stories they would share. Um, it'd be hard to build a consulting practice that way. I, I don't know of any. Um, in the you know in the spirit of what you're what you're asking though without any concrete examples I, I think it, it just is true that um, when you engage in this work um, you need to you need to kind of find people where they are um, if you approach it with too much of a purist mentality um, or or often in the in corporate sustainability there's almost religious language right they refer to, people refer to themselves as true believers and it's us versus them and if you really want to get biomimicry and this meme out into the world, you've got to take people where they are and help them take the steps they're willing to take. And sometimes you're going to find yourself maybe um, with strange bedfellows, or, or you may identify three things they ought to do, and they choose to do just one, and you don't have a whole lot of um, authority to change that. Um, I think that comes with the territory. But I do not know of any specific examples now of the money-grubbing capitalist pigs. <laughs> Yeah? I'll go for questions. So that little company you used to work for makes a lot of these little plastic things. Yeah. Can you imagine a way to use a biomimicry um, approach to solving that K cup question? Yeah, ab absolutely. I could imagine uh, there being a way to engage biomimicry to, to see what it might tell you about how to solve that problem. Absolutely. Um, I, to my knowledge, they're not pursuing biomimicry right now. They're doing some other things, trying to pursue recyclability. And I don't know where they're at on that, but um, it is, it's a logical question, yeah. yeah. What would be your advice for students, um, visitors, all of us, that would want to learn more about this, or especially, um, I'm thinking about our vision students and stuff, to bring this in. Yeah. Um, Yeah, well, so the two immediate resources, um, one would be the book, buy the book. It's been out for a while. I think it's 10 bucks on Kindle or something. Um, Biomimicry by Janine Benyus. Um, secondly is, is they have a, um, a free website called Ask Nature. I think it's, a, I think it's an org. Um, it's a database of all of the solutions that they have um, identified uh, over years and years of doing this work, and it's organized by function. So you would type into uh, the search engine on the site, um, how does nature manage water? Uh, how does nature thermoregulate? And you, you'll eventually get the hang of how to narrow your search down, like with Google, so you don't get a million results, but um, it'll pop up real examples of organisms and, and, and often applications, real world applications, built on the, the intelligence from those organisms. Um, Thirdly, uh, I would say, to, well, third and fourth, I would say that I'm, I'm a resource. Um, I'm, build, I'm trying to build a class uh, right now that, that I'd hope to offer in this area, Biomimicry 101, that I'm trying to aim at third and fourth year undergraduate business students. Um, and then as I get out of the program, I'm going to um, be building a personal practice around corporate sustainability and biomimicry. So I'd be available to anybody um, who's interested in learning more um, and, and maybe figuring out some resources to send you away. Yeah. All right. Thank you. It's covered in sharp technology. All right. You can't tell, but thank you. 
Thank you. So just remember, for those of you, yes, um, if you're interested in this stuff, we are looking for ways to bring this uh, more into the curriculum um, and, and other. We'd love to eventually have a class in biomimicry here. So if you're interested in that, keep nudging your faculty. Keep nudging and bringing that up in different places because it's something we're trying to do, but your voice will really help us do that. If you're interested in sustainability efforts on campus, Christina Erickson and our eco reps are wonderful resources. And don't forget to sign in on your way out so we can give you wonderful credit for coming. So thank you. Have a great rest of your afternoon.